Well, hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes here of quick market commentary and then get back down to some meetings. You can tell I'm in a hotel room, actually up in Beverly Hills here in Southern California, and uh, part of a two-day set of meetings with uh, the folks at Hightower and also participating in the investment forum here, a lot of money managers speaking and things like that. So really useful annual event, uh, a lot of kind of business maintenance things going on with our company and and then certainly a lot of investment discussions taking place and a couple of the other guys on our investment committee are here with me and it's, uh, it's a nice time but um, also very busy and so I'm recording here Thursday morning, market has just opened and, and I'm going to get rolling here soon enough. Um, be back in the office this afternoon. Uh, listen, uh, the market's kind of acting normal this week, which is interesting. We were, were up about three or 400 points coming into Thursday. As I'm recording right now, we're down about 100 points, and I don't know what will happen the rest of Thursday or on Friday, but you kind of have a couple up days this week and a couple down days, but neither side being really dramatic. And so... The up volatility and down volatility is somewhat subdued, which I think is is good, normalizing. Uh, one of the things I kind of talk about this week at Dividend Cafe is the um, the environment for a bottom-up fundamental investor like us that is trying to buy individual companies on their own investment merits. The less that macro circumstances, top-down macroeconomic events are impacting things, the better. We, we have a lot of confidence in letting the micro uh, elements of what we're investing in take hold and drive investment results. But that's not reality. There is constantly monetary policy, geopolitical circumstances, macroeconomic you know, events that, that, that will impact uh, how things play out, certainly in the short term and sometimes longer. And, and so with the Fed now kind of sidelined for what I expect should be most of 2019, it does subdue some of the macro uh, impact and allow for a bit more breathing room with the micro. Now, that's not to say that the macro has been totally sidelined because we still have no resolution on the trade war. Uh, there is still uh, significant vulnerability around the economic circumstances in China and even economic um, stability in Europe. And, and so there's global issues that we kind of have to continue factoring in. And of course, you can see, you know, as we get ready to go into the election year next year, uh, we had the State of the Union address this week. I think that political element lingers out there. It's less significant in the markets um, than any, like the Fed would have been a very significant element because of the relevance of monetary policy to credit markets, which drives so much of economic activity. But my point is that we're in earnings season right now. Earnings season is going very well. The earnings recession talk um, is more and more going away, uh, partially because it was really not very thoughtful to begin with, but also just empirically, the results are outperforming those earnings expectations. And, and I think that uh, this creates a bit less volatile of a market environment to be investing in. Now, that macro can come back in uh, violently and suddenly, and it's done that for different reasons throughout market history. But the Fed being off the, the list of things that I expect will have a tremendous impact on markets, at least in the short term. Um, you know, there's no question monetary policy is going to circle back around again but right now, I do. I am in the school of thought that says that both from an interest rate standpoint and dollar liquidity standpoint and the uh, rate at which they impact excess reserves in the banking system, all these kind of more technical things, but that actually have a pretty profound impact in credit markets. I think the Fed is sidelined. That takes away a big macro circumstance in the way markets are performing um, at DividendCafe.com this week, I go through a kind of longer explanation of the difference between a top-down investor and a bottom-up investor, bottom-up being someone who 
is really looking to the merits of an individual company, let's say an individual bond, an individual investment, what cash flows they believe it can generate, and the various metrics and valuations and economic realities of an individual company or individual security. And that happens to be the school of thought that we come from, but no bottom-up investor is ever pure because there's always an impact of what we call top-down circumstances, more macroeconomic ones that impact things. And, and we talk about macroeconomics as a top-down circumstance I just got done talking about for the last five minutes. We talk about countries, you know, what the environment is in Italy or Japan. And, and as American investors, we're used to talking that way. We don't talk necessarily about ABC company in Italy, but we talk about the Italian economy. And we do talk about the American economy, but we also talk about ABC company in America, and we get why we do that. However... The sector discussion is something that I think a lot of people believe drives investment results. And for bottom-up investors like the Bonson Group, I think it's important that you understand we have an allocation into, let's say, the energy sector, into the financial sector, because at the end of the day, we picked individual companies. And when you total it all up, those companies equal a certain percentage of a sector. But there's a very big difference between an incidental allocation, like just the math of what you did happens to be you have 14% here and 20% there, and actually creating to that allocation saying, hey, I want to have 14% in financials. What companies are we going to have to fill that in? I want to have 20% in energy. What companies are we going to fill that in with? We have what's called an incidental sector allocation. We are not managing to an allocation. So we're finding the companies that we want. And then within that sector allocation, we want to manage for risk. And so if we believe, well, you know what, this is too concentrated. So like a lot of technology investors in the year 2000, a lot of financial investors in the year 2008 um, would have been wise to have just, even if they were wrongly fond of the companies, they could have mitigated the risk by just limiting what the allocation of the sector was. Now, we will go to 0% in sectors. I've spent the bulk of my career at or near a 0% weighting in consumer discretionary because intrinsically the sector possesses certain uh, risk circumstances and uh, debt leverage and non-dividend um, propensities that we generally don't really find companies that fit in that world. But there are exceptions, there have been exceptions, and there always would be. But my point being, we can and do go to zero in a given sector, and we generally will limit on the upside of how high we'll go in a sector to somewhere between two and two and a half times that sector is waiting in the S&P 500. That's somewhat arbitrary, but it's a, a rules-based governor for risk mitigation. So you may wonder why I'm bringing all of this up. I think that when you don't have the Fed making a huge announcement, and when you had like a 180-point up day one day this week and a 100-point down day, it's a great week to try to use those circumstances of somewhat low, less noise in the markets to actually talk about things that are more important. I would rather talk about the basics of contrarianism, which is another thing I talk about this week at Dividend Cafe, to talk about our philosophy of bottom-up versus top-down sector allocation. I'd rather do that in a week where there isn't a whole lot of noise in the markets and so forth. Um, on a politics and money front, there was a State of the Union just this week. Um, there is this bill being pushed by Bernie Sanders and Chuck Schumer to uh, basically eliminate companies or drastically restrict and regulate their ability to buy back stock. Uh, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, the political impact to markets, we down talk it a lot for good reason, um, but it varies between being a 0% factor and then some other kind of low percent factor. But that movement from zero to whatever the number ends up being, um, you know, that can be a, a move higher that can catch people off guard. That I think that that we're going to learn more in 2019 what the uh, likelihood of various changes might be in 2020 with the election year. There's certain things on a again bottom up basis. We're watching the pharmaceutical price fixing discussions, warrant evaluation. They've been, that discussion's been on the table for a number of years. 
And of course, a big farmer last year actually in a in a tough market had a really really good year. So people get a lot of this stuff wrong. But my point being that um, we believe that the political environment right now is interesting from a political standpoint, but has very minimal impact in the markets. But there are certain side narratives that we're watching, and, and I talk about that at Politics and Money. I do need to get going here, so unfortunately I have to stop. I, I hope I've given you something this week to you find interesting. And I do know that at Dividend Cafe, there are a number of charts I would love for you to see. I absolutely love our chart of the week this week showing the kind of growth curve increase that the Congressional Budget Office has priced in around the tax cut impact and, and the uh, pro-growth um, benefits that are coming out of the tax reform bill that passed a year ago. Uh, and, and there's plenty of other stuff there as well I would encourage you to look at. So reach out to us with any questions, as always. We hope you've had uh, a wonderful week. And we always do thank you for watching and listening to The Dividend Cafe. 